Peace and welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Folks, we got a lot to cover. First and foremost, happy Friday. We're talking about the father of the school shooting. The school shooter has been charged. We're talking about the father of Ethan Crumbly. His father has now been charged after his mother was the first parent to be charged. Talking about accountability in school, uh, in school shootings. We'll be having that conversation. And then today we're going to be politicking with the city director of Hot Springs, Arkansas, Ms. Phyllis Beard, to talk to us about what she's doing on that level in the city of, of, of Hot Springs. Later on, we we'll check in with Dr. Burnett Anderson and talking about how you do, how you should not allow stress to get the best of you. And of course, we got to talk about that big decision out of Georgia as the judge rules that either District Attorney Fonnie Willis or Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade leaves the case. What do you think she will do? We'll have that discussion as well. So stay with us. This is all happening on today's edition of The Culture right here on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Hi, right, folks. Welcome to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Folks, we are streaming live right now. First and foremost, happy Friday. We are finally at the end of the year, at the end of the week. <laughs> I was going to say the end of the year. <laughs> but we are finally at the end of the week, so happy Friday. Uh, there we go. Uh, folks, we are streaming live right now on our home network of BlackStarNetwork.com. Go to our website today, download the app for free on all of your devices. Follow us on social media under Black Star Network. And we ask for your support today as a donor, as an investor, as a stakeholder. You can be a part of this digital movement as we're creating and carving the space for Black content like no other place. So go to BlackStarNetwork.com. Take care of all of that business, and we thank you so much for your support. Now, we're also streaming live on Big Brother Roland Martin's social media page. You can find us on his Facebook page, as well as on his uh, YouTube channel. And big shout out to the online culture crew that's gathered on the X platform, on Facebook, on YouTube. We appreciate y'all folks are checking in already from all around the country. We're going to get to your voice, your comments, your thoughts, your questions in a few moments, folks, as we have these big discussions. But thank you so much for checking in. All right, I'm also joined by my sister. She joins us here on Fridays now here on The Culture, and I'm always happy to have her. She is a parent and education expert and specialist. She is administrator. She's the principal at the Doris L. Morrow Online Academy, and she's a contributor here on The Culture. My sister, Kimberly Morrow, checking in as always. Kim, good afternoon. How are you today? Good afternoon. I'm feeling good today. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. It is Friday. It is Friday. All right, Kim. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the case of Ethan Crumbly. This is the uh, teenager who is the uh, uh, who was at 15 at the time when he used an SIG sawer firearm to kill four students and wound six others, and a teacher at Oxford High School on November 30th. In 2021, he was sentenced last year to prison, uh, to life in prison without parole. Well, it was just it just been announced that yesterday his father, his father has now been charged in this shooting. They found that his father and their mother and his mother, who was the first parent charged uh, for, and held responsible for a school shooter. His father has been charged and guilty of manslaughter. And now both of his parents are in prison, are going to prison because of the issues of neg negligence, of, of, of not keeping their guns safe and secure, him getting access to the guns, and also the fact that the warnings that the schools gave uh, before these, this massacre happened, saying that his mental state of mind was deteriorating and that he was off that day of the shooting on no in November of 2021. But I wanted to bring this back up because we talked about the mother being the first parent to be charged for the actions of her child as a school shooter. Now we see the father being charged. Do you think this is going to be the new precedent moving forward 
um, with school shooters and with these type of uh, issues, uh, with these type of incidents happening? I hope so. And yeah. I and I and I don't say that glibly. I I mean I hope so in the fact that when it's this egregious as it was with his parents, his parents were aware of his mental decline. His parents were asked to take him home by the um, school counselor. So they were very well aware, and yet they still bought him a gun four days before. They still allowed him access to the weapon. And then they tried to run after the fact. So yeah, I really hope, and I hope this sends a message to parents that you cannot allow your child access to guns, especially when you know that they have some mental health issues going on. So it's, just, uh, you, so it's, it's interesting because um, they they omitted all the signs here, Kimberly. They did not take heed to any of the signs. They did not take heed to his behavior. They did not take heed to what the school was saying. They did not take heed to the fact that, you know, the father bought this firearm, placed it in a house, and he did not safely secure it in a way where his son was going to, would not be able to get it. He did not put the safety on. I mean, he just, and he, the crazy part about it is he bought the firearm for the boy. Yes. Yes. So, it, and, and that's the crazy part about it. And, you know, I think it's the state of Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I believe it's the state of Louisiana. Just, just passed the bill. <laughs> I don't understand this at all. But the, just passed the gun bill that will allow 18-year-olds to get the gun without permits. And so we're in a situation right now where you have this trial going on. We have this high number of school shootings that have occurred in 2020, 20, 2023, going into 2024. And yet there are still states in this country that are very, very lackadaisical about their restrictions on gun access, gun possession, gun ownership. And so you can, what, what, do we, what do we do with that? And, and you can still be in high school at 18. That you can is, still be in high school. You can still be in high school. So basically you're allowing high school students because they are high school students that are 18 to buy a gun without a permit and have access to the schools i i don't understand it i'm laughing because it's not funny but it's just no. i don't know what else to do you, you know what i mean it's like i'm it's a nervous laughter it's a i this all of these things are unheard of. And I, I don't even know how to respond, Faraji. No, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. And, and I, look, look, it left me speechless as well. It definitely left me speechless as well. Look, we're going to take our first pause. When we come forward, uh, you know, Kimberly, I would love to get your take on how the school should respond to these changes, to these policies, and to this precedent that has been set in the Crumbly case. Folks, we're just getting started. Post your comments on the chat as we're streaming live on Brother Roland Martin's Facebook page and on his YouTube channel. We would love to hear what you have to say. And of course, stay tuned. We still got a lot more to cover in this first half of the culture right here on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network, every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network 
focus is on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, you're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. We are talking just a little bit about the latest case of a school shooter whose parents are being held accountable for his actions. We're talking about school shooter Ethan Crumbly, who uh, killed four people in a school shooting and injured six back in 2021. And just yesterday, his father... Uh, was charged with manslaughter, just like his mother was, and was being held accountable for their negligence in everything from preventing access to the gun to not heeding the warnings from the schools. This is the parents of Ethan Crumbly right here. Both of them have been charged. This is the first set of parents in the United States that have been held accountable for their child's actions as a school shooter. And so we've been checking in with my sister, Kimberly Morrow, who is a parent and education specialist, uh, to talk to us about the ramifications, the implications of this particular case. But Kim, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, just as much as we talk about the gun control, gun reform, and all of that stuff, having access to guns because uh, Ethan's dad bought the gun a couple of few days before this incident happened. For what reason? I do not know, right? but it was a major firearm. But more importantly, he didn't take the necessary precautions to keep it safe and away and all of those things to prevent those four children from being killed, those six people from being injured. Um, what are the schools going to do? That's what, I, that's what I'm wondering. Like we have conversations about this, but I don't hear unless there are, and I mean, certainly we're not in every state, but you know, we, we're not having these conversations from the school side to ensure that those who are following the rules going to school each and every day, that they're going to be found safe. We hear about drills, but I'm talking about real policy that is going to hold 
either the school is, uh, the shooters accountable, parents accountable. I don't know who else is going to be made accountable, but how can the schools respond to this? This is something that the school board should, around the country school board should be taking up this because as we talked about before, a lot of decisions of a lone principal cannot simply just make a lone decision because of course it could be overturned by the school district or the school board. But one thing that should definitely go in place, especially when you're talking to students that are troubled, um, as in the case with the, with the little young kid, um, who brought the gun to school and, and shot his teacher. We should be allowed to ask the questions, are there firearms in the home? And if there are, are those firearms secured? And when you're having the conversations with the parents of these troubled students, you there should be a form that you are reading from and you are checking off and the parents sign off on Yes, I understand. Yes, we have firearms. They are secured. No, we do not have firearms, et cetera, et cetera. So that way, there's another level of documentation and a le another level in place to make sure that students are secure. Also, parents have to be well aware, obviously, if they're watching um, the news, they'll be made aware that they can be held liable if after speaking with the school staff, the staff has explained to you the child's mental illness could lead to um, certain ramifications and you still make that choice, you now know you can be held liable. And I think those, those are conversations that counselors um, and principals should definitely be having with parents per the school board policy. Again, I, I don't wanna have people going, hey, I saw on this newscast that she said we should do that. It, it has to be in their school board's policy in order for them to do it. And I think school boards need to get on rewriting their policies in regards yeah. to this. I agree. I totally agree. Uh, let me check in with the crew. Folks are checking in. Um, some new uh, some new names I see here in the chat. The Godiva, Godiva Kitty, the Godiva Kitty, you said as they should have been charged, glad the court set a precedent, absolutely. I'm glad they set a precedent as well, Godiva Kitty, um, because um, this will may thwart or at least cause parents to think twice about having guns in the house, or if you have a gun in the house that you're going to take the necessary precautions. Um, Francesca Epps, you said nothing wrong with owning a firearm. However, in my opinion, a person should be 21 and over to own one, and certain firearms should be banned, such as AK-47s uh, and AR-15s, et cetera. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. Um, and I think it's interesting that we still are in this space right now, after all of these shootings, Kim, that uh, we are seeing legislation, like I told you, like I mentioned, there are gun laws in the state of Louisiana. And I'm pulling this up here real quick if I want to make sure. I mean, 18 years old, 18 years old. Should parents, as a as a as a, a parent advocate, as a parent uh, as a parent uh, specialist, should, what what can parents do about this? Because you, we know policy coming from the federal government, policy even coming from your local school district, can be a slow moving process. And with some of these cases, time is of the essence. So how can parents? become more proactive in helping to prevent these type of things? Do the parents need to talk to their children about this type of stuff? What can parents do, Kimberly? Well, that's where it starts, right? Um, mm -hmm. I heard you, you said someone in the chat said, um, it's nothing wrong with owning guns. I, I have family that are from the South and it was nothing for um, the boys to have guns and the girls to have guns. And still to this day, I have family members from the South who their kids have guns, but they are trained on how to use them. They understand that they use them when they go out um, um, hunting or you know for various things that are sanctioned activities. So, but parents definitely need to have those, th that's where the conversation starts with parents. The problem is with a lot of these school shooters, what we have seen is that the parents aren't having these conversations. 
their very lives of days ago. And we've seen that time and time again with these um, students who have become these school shooters or the parents did not even know that they had weapons. So it wasn't even a matter of them training them how to use them and what's appropriate. They weren't even aware that the kids owned weapons. So definitely the parents need to be leading these conversations. And if they need help with how to have the conversations, there are definitely agencies and, and organizations that will help them with that, including their schools. Those, those teachers and staff members would be happy to help intervene with the parents. So mm. it's definitely a conversation that should start in the home. Yeah, absolutely. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that's the place I was talking about, Kimberly, very quickly, where now they are, um, it, 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 should, it is expected to be signed by Governor Jeff Landry down in Louisiana, where he plans to sign the legislation of a bill allowing Louisiana residents 18 and older to carry a concealed handgun without a permit received a final approval from lawmakers back in the latter part of February. So we're looking at a situation that the gun culture and more important, just the fact that, that we're having conversations about guns in this way, where now 18 year olds can start to get access to guns very quickly. I mean, why come up with this type of legislation when you have hundreds of mass shootings that have occurred already in 2024, we don't speak about it like this, we used to, but they are happening. In 2023, we saw a number of mass shootings. There was an uptick in mass shootings, especially on school grounds. Why are we still seeing legislation where people are like, oh, you can carry a gun at 18 years old without a permit? Those people who are gun lobbyists, Second Amendment rights, they are digging their heels in this. They are saying, you are not going to take away our gun rights. As a matter of fact, we're gonna make sure they get extended. This is all a part of this culture to you're not going to tell us what to do attitude. That we, we see our congressmen in Washington with this same attitude, it doesn't matter how many shootings there are, they are still holding the line with, it's our second amendment right. You're not going to take away our Second Amendment right. And they're digging in. It's, it's as though it's a matter of we're going to show you. We're, we're wow. going to show you. That is wild. That is absolutely wild. And that's why we're talking about so much stuff happening in this country. And unfortunately, Kim, I don't think things are going to get any better, especially in these uh, conservative Republican led states around the country. That is absolutely mind blowing. All right, look, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, let's switch gears. Let's have a little conversation with city director of Hot Springs, Arkansas, Ms. Phyllis, Ms. Phyllis Beard. She's going to be joining us in a few moments for our politicking uh, session here on The Culture. So stay with us. It's The Culture here on the Black Star Network. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. There's an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Pull up a chair. 
Take your seat, The Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hi, I'm Pastor Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. All right, folks, welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in. I am also joined by our contributor, Kimberly Morrow, who is a parent and education advocate, uh, who's a parent advocate, education uh, educator, as well as the principal of the Doris L. Morrow Online Academy. And uh, we're just going to switch gears here, talking a little bit about city politics and national, more national politics, as we have our conversation now with the city director for Hot Springs, Arkansas, Miss Phyllis Beard is now going to be joining us. Phyllis, thank you so much for joining us here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, we got we got your voice. We just don't see it. There we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, Phyllis, thank you so much for joining us. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Hot Springs, Arkansas, give us a little geo- you know, geographical uh, understanding of, of where the city of Hot Springs is. Okay, so Arkansas basically is a, a square and Little Rock is in the center of the square and Hot Springs is about 50 miles southwest of Little Rock. So we're about That's an beautiful. hour away. So as city director, is that akin to being the mayor of the city? Is that how that works or, or what? Well, actually, um, it is the same as a council person. So okay. um, we we used to have, um, as, as a kid growing up, we had the mayor alderman um, form of government. And that was changed because of one or, no, actually two um, men that talk too much. They changed mm. the form of government. Um, and, and then we have now a city director mayor form of government. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> and, so, and Phyllis, man, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say the man that talked too much, that was my father. No. <laughs> so, here I am. <laughs> so, what's the, what's the population of Black folks in Hot Springs, Arkansas? I think we're about 10%. About wow. 10%. Wow. 
Okay. Okay. So talk to us a little bit about the work that you're doing, because we know that you are a part of the National League of Cities conference that is being held, that was held uh, over these past few days. What, what, talk about the work that you're doing in Hot Springs. Okay. So I was sworn in of Jan January of last year. So I'm about 15 months on the job. I'm learning a lot. Um, and I had a lot, th a lot of things to say. So that's why I ran. But um, I told people when I was campaigning that I'm here to be a voice for, you know, just to say things at City Hall that people didn't feel was necessarily being said. So one of the things that I encountered last year being in the South, as we um, are prone to heat emergencies, where the it gets really hot above 100 degrees. So um, one of the things that I encountered was... Um, um, uh, problems with landlords and we didn't have an, um, we were not following the international property maintenance code as far as providing air conditioning. So it just became like a really sticky situation where tenants were um, being charged for air conditioning. They were also on section eight. Um, and it was a long list of problems that I've been working on. Then there's other things that are day to day about, um, there was a 75 year old woman. She is being chased by dogs in our neighborhood. So I, I um, actually went, the dog um, had a court date. So I went to court with with um, the woman just to, just cause we became like a, had a bond and she really wanted me there. So I came to that. Um, also some streets are um, needing to be paved um, and some streets, well, there there's a long list of streets so we can't get to everyone at once. So. There were yeah. people in my district that particularly said, hey, can you make sure my street is on the on the list next? So those were generally the kind of things I um, got involved with this first year. That's awesome. That is awesome. Basic city government services, constituent services, things that are so, so important to us. Uh, Phyllis, I want to kind of, you know, dive into this conversation, talking a little bit about the 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 what we're seeing now with the political landscape of this country right now and more importantly how it is affecting black america now like you mentioned 10 percent of the city is about black uh, or black folks but there is uh, there has been a conversation that is about uh black people getting some sense of power especially in states of the south in the midwest a lot of where our you know ancestors and our grandparents and the folks came from um, do you see any type of renaissance of political consciousness in your area or in the state of Arkansas that's showing that Arkansas is actually shifting to a different to a different uh, track or a different vision? Well, to say that I see a renaissance of that, I would need to see more people voting. Um, and that's something that we have to work on. You know, there's a lot of things that are not necessarily in our interest and in are in our favor, and we are not showing up to the ballot box. So that's number one. Um, number two, as far as like holding people running for office and holding office, I um, actually was in a race with um, three other African Americans and um, and a uh, um, Caucasian gentleman. So it it kind of put the whole town on edge because this district had been run continuously since 1970 um, up until now, except maybe for about six months. It had been run by um, uh, African-American. So our city does have one district that is a minority majority district. So mm -hmm. with that race, the last race that I ran, people were were concerned if, if it was going to be represented by, um, you know, someone that didn't have the general community's best interest at heart. Absolutely. And I want to kind of talk a little bit more about what they term as the great migration. Uh, columnist Charles Blow put out that piece, South to Black Power, how returning to the South can be a way of empowerment, political empowerment, social and economic empowerment. And so I want to have that part of the conversation on the other side with you, along with my sister Kim, and of course with the culture crew. So folks, stay with us. We still got a lot more to talk about as we check in with city director 
uh, Phyllis Beard, who we're politicking this uh, with this in this segment as we talk about Hot Springs, Arkansas, and its impact on the rest of the country. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat, The Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hatred on the streets. A horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, white people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Check it in and politicking with city director Phyllis Beard, who of the city of Hot Springs, Arkansas. She is joining us today, along with my sister, Kimberly Morrow, as we talk a little bit about what's going on in local government and more importantly, how black folks can get um, some sort of political empowerment, even in the smallest of districts and jurisdictions. So. Uh, I want to pose this question again for you, uh, Phyllis, uh, as, as we, we talk about this, which is Black folks getting political empowerment, getting political power 
in southern states, states that have traditionally shut us out of systems, shut us out of opportunities, are we seeing some changes now today than say 20 years ago? Is there some some new things that are happening? What's your take on that? I would I I would say that we are just now at you know the the start of my term. I like I'm I'm the only African American on my city council, but I will have to say that a lot of younger people are watching and paying attention more. Um, you know, from my vantage point, I see that people are interested now. Um, I did start a voter registration drive when I was a candidate, and that was to try to register 100 voters. I only got about 67, but it's an ongoing process. So um, far as as my town goes, I, I definitely see an interest. You know, I'm also um, bringing people aware because there are people that are the African Americans that are visible in our town. You have teachers, nurses, you know, that kind of thing. And then, you know, we we do have two um, African Americans in our county government. So I just kind of want to make it more, I guess, um, obtainable or fun or something that's um, really interesting and interesting to do because I am out there helping people and people see and they're. Um, you know, they're they're starting to pay attention more. I, I think it'll take a few election cycles where other people will join in and um, come in from other districts and run. But, you know, all the politics, I think, starts at the local level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kim, what do you make of, of, of you know, this idea as Charles Blow, columnist Charles Blow calls it, the Great Migration moving from some of these northern urban centers down to the south to get political empowerment? You know, I I thought about that. My father lives in Arkansas. There it is, <laughs> there it is. Arkansas. I'm not okay. sure how far that is from you. Um, but I had actually thought about that. But then I also think about the fact that, you know, we're so few of the population. So we, if we start moving out of the cities where we are, then we're losing the African American population in those cities. So I thought I heard him say that, and I thought about it, and I was like, I don't know. How, be, we're what did you say last week? We're what thirteen percent of the population. Thirteen percent in the country. 13%, yeah. Percent. So yeah. All we're doing is shifting our numbers. Um, we've got to figure out a way, and we talked about this before how to how to create allies so that we're we're not having to now we're shifting out of the northern cities or even out of California but and we're going to the south but then our presence in these cities is then missed and then we put our african american politicians in jeopardy of being reelected to offices so i'm not really sure i would agree with that position I, I understand. Uh, Sister Bill Phyllis, what, what is the, 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 the talk right now, especially around the election, the, the upcoming the presidential election? Are folks excited? Are Black folks in, this, in the city of Hot Springs and around the state, are they excited about what they're seeing, how this whole thing is playing out? Honestly, we're, keep it, we're keep in... It, keep it up. Keep it 100. <laughs> keep it a buck. Keep yes, it a buck, we... man, sis. Well, well, we, um, so let me, so uh, can I tell you this? At the National League of Cities, we yeah. met with our um, congressional delegation and they were, um, that one of the congressional leaders said that we are, he's looking to um, it, the entire delegation from Arkansas holding a, a position where they're head of the, um, I can't think of the word, they're going to be head of the drawing a blank. But you know, the people that hold the gavel, head of the committee. Head so, of, right. Yeah. So this is, um, and he speaks of the um, Republicans taking back the House. And this is, you know, things that, that they're all looking forward to. So I think that's very, or could be very likely, but, you know, all that to say is the entire delegation from Arkansas is Republican. Wow. And Yes. And so far as as people here, like my neighbors excited about that, 
I, I can't say. I mean, people vote. I don't know if we even have enough registered voters to shift that, you know, but mm. I think people have become complacent because that's just how things are right now. And, and for someone, it, it's so Republican that they won't even get an opponent a lot of times. So is Dang. there an excitement? <laughs> I wouldn't use excitement as a word. Well, let me ask you this: We got we got we we got about thirty or so seconds left. Uh, are you excited? Like, how do you keep in, look knowing the fact that you're like the only black woman in, in in some of these spaces, right? Knowing that the the population of the city is not for black folks is not at a high rate. Knowing that you got this strong Republican hold within the state, how are you personally? you know, keeping your head up and, and keeping your eyes on the prize and, and making sure that the work that you do really does create a, a pathway and opportunities for the next generation of young black leadership. Yes, I keep um, in close contact with our Republican friends. And I remind people often that some of them used to be Democrat. So we also have to, um, you know, while we are, they don't have the same number or letter, by their names, it is very important just to keep them on their toes, ask questions, you know, find something that you share in common with them as often as possible. And that's helping. I mean, it's going to take a long time or not a long time, but a process. And that's something that I encourage. And, and I also have a YouTube channel where I want to or I'm encouraging other people to run for office because that's how I documented my campaign. So to encourage other people if they're ever interested. All right, what's, what's, the, what's, what's the YouTube channel? Let's put that out there. Okay, thank you. That's Phyllis for City Director. That is right there, I Phyllis take, for City Director. I take Director. you from filing, filing to getting sworn in, the whole journey. Wow, that's what that's what I'm talking about. So you always you you trying to create a a a, a pathway right there. That it is wonderful. With, yeah, thank you, thank you so that, much. That is that is absolutely wonderful. Well, Phyllis, we thank you so much for your time to join us this afternoon. Um, I know that you are connected with a lot of great folks at the National League of Cities and doing some great work. And uh, you know, we just hope that and pray that you continue to to keep the torch going keep that fire going because we're going to need it over these next few months we are going to need it whether it's in smaller districts like hot springs or in larger major um, cities we are going to need all the help that we can get all hands on deck from this point forward so phyllis thank you for your great work and more importantly thank you for joining us here on the culture all right thank you so much absolutely all right folks we got to take a quick pause when we come forward Let's uh, let's talk about how to get beat the stress in your life. We're going to be checking in with Dr. Bernadette Anderson about that. Also, later on, we got to tell you about the evolving breaking news, that evolving story, that developing story that it got everybody talking out of the state of Georgia. It has been reported that uh, special prosecutor Nathan Wade has officially resigned and stepped away from the case, leading leaving uh, D.A. Fronnie Willis to stay on the case per the conditions set out by Judge McAfee in that, that decision. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So we still got a lot to get to in the second half. Stay with us. We're just getting started here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause 
to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Farad G. Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Happy Friday. Happy, happy Friday, folks. Uh, we are streaming live right now on our home website at blackstarnetwork.com. Make sure you do your due diligence. Go to our website today. Download the app of Black Star Network on all of your devices. Follow us on social media at Black Star Network. And, of course, we ask you that you support us here today as we are striving to provide you that digital content that is uniquely and specially prepared for Black America in the midst of all of this other stuff we're dealing with. So your support, your donations makes a world of difference for us. We want you to be stakeholders and investors in this whole process. So your support means the world. So make sure you go to our website today at Black Star Network, and we thank you so much for your donations. Big shout out to Rosalind Fletcher, who checked in and she's a part of the culture career and she put something in the bucket. So Rosalind, thank you so much. There we go. Thank you, Rosalind. I hope you're Friday. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, but thank you so much for your support. All right, folks, now we're also streaming on Big Brother Roland Martin's YouTube channel where you'll find the illustrious culture crew as well as on its Facebook page where we also have culture crew members on there and on the X platform. So you can find us there as well. So big shout out to all the crew members there on the X platform as well. Now, folks, I uh, want to shift gears as we talk from politics to health and wellness and how to keep our minds right in the midst of so much uncertainty. Uh, we're going to be joined in a few moments with Dr. Bernadette Anderson, but I want to welcome our other fantastic contributor. She's always bringing that smoke on Fridays. Her and Kim, they come again, they come on the show and they try to embarrass me week after week. So I'm so happy to bring her back onto the show. My sister, Corinna Denise. 
Happy Friday, Happy Friday, Corinna. Corinna is a uh, college admission specialist. She is an activist political, and she is one of our great voices and contributors here on The Culture. And of course, we are still joined by my sister, Kimberly Morrow, who is a parent advocate and educator and principal of Doris L. Morrow Online Academy. All right, Corinna, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's, bring, so let's bring another fantastic Black woman on. She is a uh, medical doctor. She is stationed in uh, Columbus, Ohio as a family physician, but now she's also the author of a new book called Fulfilled, where she chronicled over two decades of healthcare experiences as she comp presents a compelling new vision for medicine, one that combines the precision of science with the empathy of human understanding. That's fantastic. So let's now welcome to the Airways of Black Star Network and to the culture, Dr. Bernadette Anderson. Dr. Anderson, welcome to the culture. How are you this afternoon? Hello, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. First and foremost, congratulations on your book. You fulfilled. You put it out there. You, you got something to say and you want people to hear it and you want people to have a reimagined look at health care, especially around health and wellness. Talk to us, what was the inspiration behind this book? Actually, the inspiration behind the book was my own life. I understand mm -hmm. that if we only focus on the physical health, that we'll never achieve wellness. And I think all of us want to be well, mind, body, and spirit. And the focus tends to be only on the physical health. And as you can see, over decades and decades, we haven't made that many advances in our health. And I think that one of the problems is we don't, include the whole self, the mind, the body, and the spirit. Do you feel like, and I'm going to have my sisters Corinna and Kimberly to ju jump in when y'all, you know, want to, but I'm kicking the ball off. Do you feel like we're now, because everybody is talking more, Doc, about mental health, we're talking more about, you know, self-care, we're talking more about um, the just the overall structure of, of traditional medicine, and now we're trying to integrate more holistic practices in this in this whole situation. Do you think we're getting further along, or are we still at we still we still got to cover some necessary ground? Where, where do you think we stand right now? I definitely think we're getting further along because there's there's an awareness that we can't just solely focused on our physical health. But the thing is, we have to be consistent with it. You know, I always hear people talk about um, self-care in terms of going to the spa or going on vacation, but it needs to be something that occurs every single day in your life. Just the way we feed ourselves every day. We don't wait to eat when we go on vacation, right? So we have to include these, these things, um, whatever it is for you, whether it be meditation or journaling or, you know, exercising, it needs to be an everyday thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what, Doc, Corinna and Kimberly, I always find it funny that people say self-care, but then they spending money. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm going to be honest with you. You know what I mean? Sometimes spending money is an anxious process. You're going to be like, ah, I got to think about the budget. I got to think about this. I got to think about doing, uh, how much is that? It would seem like spending money would add to the stress. Uh, but, but I think it's interesting that people's like, my self care is going to and spending more money. And then it's like, once you get past that moment, then you get back to the stress and be like, why the hell did I just do that? <laughs> so, Doc, so talk to us like, what does that mean when you're talking about this, uh, this approach that you're taking? You're, you're saying science with the empathy of human understanding. What does that mean exactly? So, what I'm talking about is that, you know, we've already studied. Um, disease processes, hypertension, diabetes, um, high cholesterol, heart disease. But we talk about these things just in terms of the disease, just in terms of the science. What I'm asking people to do is look deeper. Why do we even have these problems? Where are they coming from? What, is, what does it mean when we say we have hypertension? Are we stressed out? Is that why our blood pressure is high? We're looking at solely numbers, but I want to look at the whole picture so that we can give people the tools they need to actually take care of themselves and live that life that we all are talking about. And, you know, just to your point, self-care does not have to mean uh, breaking the budget. It doesn't mean breaking the budget. Corinna, what's your take on this, sis? Well, hi, Doc. Thank you for hi. being with us here today. Um, well, actually, I try to budget my self-care. I got to include that in the monthly budget, right? You make sure you, you pay for all of it. 
your housing accommodations and whatnot, but definitely need some self-care. And you already know I love to travel. Like I work hard, I got to travel. Um, but I, I would like to ask Dr. Anderson, um, I'm sure you probably find a lot of us, um, I'm finding now that we hold a lot of stress in our body, um, mm. meaning that, you know, when we're stressed, we're overwhelmed with certain things or things are happening in our lives, it might play out in a physical condition, right? Like, it seems like I've always heard doctors say, you know, a lot of the cancers, um, stress is like a very prevalent factor in that. Um, or, you know, just having certain joints or something in your body hurt, we tend to hold a lot of stress within our system. So do you find um, that maybe a lot of the patients that you've seen or just generally based on the research, I'm sure you did a lot of research to write your book um, and your experience that we carry a lot of the stress in our bodies because we're not talking to therapists. We're kind of holding all of these things within that we're battling mentally. And then at the end of the day, it comes out physically. Mm. Great question. Absolutely, absolutely. You know what I find is that we don't really take stress seriously. You know, I hear people say, oh, you know, um, no, I'm no more stressed than normal. I think it has become such a normal part of our life that we don't understand even when we are dealing with stress. I, I recall a patient Damn. coming into my office and she had this extremely elevated blood pressure, so much so that my nurse came and got me from another patient's room. And so I took her in the room and I just took her through something just so simple, like a breathing technique. And then I gave her that tool and told her to keep practicing this. I'm going to go to another room I'm gonna go, and I'm going to come back and we're going to reevaluate your blood pressure. Just in that time, just taking time to be still, to breathe and to really um, mm. establish the stress. Her blood pressure dropped 15 points in that little bit of time with just sitting, wow. eating, turning the lights off. Stress is real and it does exacerbate conditions. While it may not cause high blood pressure, it may not cause diabetes, it makes those conditions worse. Wow. In just that few minutes, her blood pressure went down 15 points. Wow. Just by her just standing still, just to take and breathing, breathing in and breathing out, and just taking that moment to just to be still. I'm telling you, um, 478 breathing, this technique that Dr. Andrew Wild came up with is like my go-to. I use it over and over throughout my day. It's just, it's that, it's, I call it my reset button. It helps me focus, get back into what I'm doing and not be worried about what just happened, what is going to happen. We find ourselves so many times living in the past, worrying about the future, and that affects our health. So just taking a moment to breathe and say, you know what, let me check in with myself. It makes a difference. It truly, truly makes a difference in your yeah, health. That is, yeah, that, is, that, that, is, that will make a difference. Look, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, more conversation with Dr. Bernadette Anderson. Folks, I want to hear from you, crew. Post your comments, share your thoughts in the chat as we're streaming live on Big Brother Roland Martin's Facebook page and on his YouTube channel. We're talking about not allowing stress to get the best of you. And I want to hear what you have to say. So stay tuned, join the conversation, and we'll be right back with more of the culture here on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot 
tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. As I'm joined by my two dynamic uh, contributors, we're joined by Kimberly Morrow, who is a parent advocate and educator, my sister, Corinna Denise, who is a college admissions advisor and political strategist. And we are also joined by our very special guest, Dr. Bernadette Anderson, who is the author of the book, Fulfilled, and she is talking to us about how letting not to let stress get the best of you. There it is. Look at that. She looks like she is in total zen. Doc, you are like, you are like completely calm. You're like, please, nothing is going to disturb my peace today. Um, I hear you. I hear you. Doc, um, and, and then Kimberly, I want to get your take on this. So when we, you you have in this book fulfilled, you talk about these 52 actionable insights. Now, we can't go through all 52 because of, uh, of course, because of time, but you're talking about a lot of different things that a lot of self-work, I like to call it, right? A lot of self-work. You're talking about personal growth. You're talking about self-forgiveness. You're talking about inner peace, right? We are in a very unique time, I think, Doc, where, and I'm going to just say this, like for a long time, people used to just say, hey, you got a problem, go to God, turn to God, go to church, and then it kind of fixes you up. But now I'm seeing something different. It's not necessarily a rejection of organized religion, but I am seeing that there is an emergence of new practices that people are taking to find inner peace. Can you kind of help us and speak to this? Like, how do we integrate this? Because I see everybody going from soothsayers to card readers to, you know, we, 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 I mean, everybody's trying to find inner peace and everybody's trying to find how they can, they achieve that high level of Zen. What's your take on all of that? You know, I'm so glad you asked that question because 
I think so often, especially in our community, we think that if we go to a therapist or um, practice mindfulness practices, that somehow that means we have lack of faith. We don't have to have, you know, that they don't have anything to do with each other. I always say you can pray on your way to your therapist. Okay, so you don't just because you're seeing a therapist, just because you've decided to um, have a meditation practice, it has nothing to do with your faith. Listen, we need some tangible tools to help us in our everyday life to get through the things that we need to get through. And yes, have an active prayer life. I have an active prayer life, but I also have these tools in my toolkit that I can pull on and draw from to strengthen me when I need it. And that's really important. That's really important. Kimberly, what's, what's your take on that? Um, well, a couple of things. One, our churches are now, I know my church does and a couple of churches that I visited now have um, mental health wellness lines, you know, um, phone lines and, and groups and they actually advocate for you to go and see a therapist and um one church that i attend they even have a um a therapist on site so we're starting to see that shift in a lot of churches and a lot of black churches so i'm very happy about that because i believe in therapy but yeah. i do have something for um uh, dr anderson go ahead come on um dr anderson i work with a lot of parents and when I am talking to them about self-care, I'll get responses such as when Faraji said, you know, it costs money to do this. And um, even Corinna mentioned she budgets her self-care. But a lot of the parents I work with, there is no money to budget for self-care. So would you please talk about how there are ways to take care of oneself without breaking the bank or without it costing mm. any money. You talked about the breathing, which was one thing, but can you maybe give a couple of quick tips for them that will mm. not cost anything? Absolutely. When, we, when you think about self-care, you need to think about those things that bring you joy in your life. And they could just be just as simple as a meet up with a friend, a play date um, in the case of children, exercise, you know, it doesn't, you know, writing um, uh, a positive affirmation, you know, repeating those things to yourself. So when we talk about self care, yes, going on that vacation is beautiful, but there are things that you need to do in your everyday life. For instance, one of the things that I do when I get up every morning is I put on a sticky, something good about me and I stick it to my mirror so that throughout the day, I can remember what I said about me. So no matter what the world says, I go back to what I said because I need to be able to affirm myself. So self-affirmation, that's a way of taking care of yourself. It's a way of taking care of your mind and it won't cost you anything. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's a great question. That's it. a great Thank point you. too, Kimberly. Uh, the great question around that. And, and, and it forced me to, it kind of caused me to, uh, to to bring up this topic, Corinna and Kimberly and Doc. When you're in a space of doing self-care, you really have to be, well, you really, it requires a high level of self-awareness, right? To even recognize that, you know what? I am stressed or you know what? I'm not healed or you know what? This is, this is disturbing my peace. Like you have to be in tune with yourself and, and Doc, I want to kind of get your take on this. So much of our culture is on the outside of ourselves. It emphasizes what's on the outer part of the way we look, the clothes we wear, the cars and the, we drive, the places we live, the people we hang out with, stuff that's on the outside. And I'm seeing it more and more that the journey on the inside is a journey that a lot of us are afraid to take because we don't want to face the darkness that lies within, right, For so to speak. We don't want to really deal with the, in, the, the inner turmoil, the trauma, the pain, right? So we do things on that's, that's always accommodating on what people see and not working on the part that people don't see. Now, I might be completely wrong when I say that, but I know that was my problem <laughs> for a long time, for a long time. How do we how do we get past that part within our self care self healing journey to not be afraid to see ourselves authentically? 
You know, one of the things you said is so, so true. We are often afraid to take that journey within because we don't want to go to those dark places. But for me personally, it wasn't about so much going to a dark place. It was about getting freedom. Emotional freedom was what I was after. And I think that's the way we have to look at it. It's not a journey just to go back there, just to dig up some old stuff. It's about going back there and getting emotional freedom. One of the things I talk about in my book is the art of forgiveness. That's something that most of us deal with so um, on, a, on a daily basis, or at least some at some point in our lives, this unforgiveness that just keeps us stuck from moving to that place that we need to be. And when I went back to that and had to do some forgiveness, not because somebody asked me to, but because I wanted to be free, it made such a huge difference in my perspective in life, what I was able to move forth in. So it's not going to the dark place just to bring back up dark things. It's going to the dark place to get emotional freedom. And that's the way we have to look at it. Yeah, you can look nice on the outside, but I see a lot of people who are hurting on the inside. A lot of people who are in prison, em emotional yes. prison. Yes, yes. And, and and how do you, and how, you know, I wanna kind of go back to, to when, when we find ourselves getting into a higher elevated space, and I know we gotta take another pause, but when we find ourselves getting into a higher elevated space, how does that same energy, that same spirit penetrate or, or at least spill over to other people around us, our close, the people that are close to us, whether it's family, whether it's friends, our, our, our colleagues, those who are close to us? Because now I'm starting to see that, that everybody is like, oh, everybody is toxic, right? So no, I can't deal with toxic people and I'm stepping away. And it's like, bro, we all are kind of toxic, aren't we? Yeah, but the Wait, Cor Cor Corinna said, Corinna said, for right, you know, you toxic. You know, I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm just nodding and smiling. That's all. Right. <laughs> Corinna's like, yeah, I'm toxic. That's toxic behavior. Classic toxic behavior. Help um, it down. <laughs> <laughs> but Doc, how, how do we make sure that as we get to that place, we don't get so high and mighty that we don't encourage other people to get to that place. Because I, I see a lot of that too, that people say, oh no, I stick to myself because y'all are toxic, y'all are this and y'all are that. And it's like, but you just got, un you just you just read Dr. Anderson's book yesterday though. <laughs> you know, it's so important that you understand this journey is for you, okay? So, okay. and as we improve ourselves, those people around us are gonna see those different things in us. Now, sometimes I'll be honest with you, it means changing the circle a little bit, changing those because mm -hmm. you need that those people around you who are going to support that journey. And, and, you know, here's the thing for me. Uh, I had to learn on my journey that I needed to set some boundaries, even with my family and my loved ones. And that was hard for them. But when they understood what it was doing in my life and when they understood, you know, the places that, you know, I was going, they were so supportive of that. When you teach people how to treat you and you respect you, then it's not about just going higher. It's about living the life you were put here to live. Mm, that takes a lot of courage, Doc. It does. It, it does. takes a lot of courage. Yep. It yep. It takes a lot of courage. And, and, and you might, and you get pushback from family and friends, people close to you and be like, oh, now you change it. Right. But it's okay to change. Sometimes we need to change, right? That's right. That's facts. Darlene Griffin, you said unforgiveness only traps the person who was holding that unforgiveness inside. Uh, would you agree with that, Doc? Absolutely. I agree with that. You know, I think it was, um, I think it's Max Lucado who said, you know, uh, when you forgive somebody, it's like going and setting a prisoner free and realizing that prisoner was you, you know, and so... It's so true. You're the only one who's trapped. You know, sometimes people don't even know we haven't forgiven them. And here's, you know, so we're holding on to a grudge that, and they don't even realize that we're holding on to the grudge. It's That's about right. you. It's not about the person. It's not about the circumstances. It is about you being free. That is, you don't like my music. You said too many folks get too worked up about things they can't change. That makes us miserable. That sounds like the serenity prayer, Doc. <laughs> That's yeah. I mean, we do. We get worked up about stuff, man. Like, you know, people get worked up about stuff. And I'm like, well, the people that are involved in the situation not even as worked up as you. So why are you worked up? Exactly. Exactly. Right. Right. So how do we prevent that from happening? Because it's easy to get worked up about other people's lives. You know, it's something you just said. You have to look at the things you can change and the things that you cannot change. But your focus should be on your life. 
you know, I'm dealing with me and I teach, I give my patients the tools so that they can deal with themselves and their um, problems and issues. So don't get so involved in other people's lives that you forget the things you need to work out in your own life. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Heard that, Corinna? Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do we get Don's book? <laughs> there we go. There we go. Because Kimberly and Coretta, they need to pass it out to some folks. Uh, how can we get your book, Doc? So you can get it from Amazon, um, bookshop.org, and Barnes and Nobles. There it is, folks. The book is called Fulfilled. The author is Dr. Bernadette Anderson. There she is. And this is a book that talks about, excuse me, over it includes over two decades of healthcare experiences. It's a new vision for medicine combining science with the empathy of human understanding. I absolutely love that thing. Uh, and it has a number of actionable insights that you can use to guide your life, to get you into a better place mentally, emotionally, physically, and all over through the integration of both holistic and traditional medicine. And our sister, Dr. Bernadette Anderson, is the author of this fantastic uh, piece of work. Doc, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for, more importantly, for putting out this work based upon your personal experience, your professional experience, so that way we can all be better for the culture. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, let's talk about what's happening in Georgia. Fonnie Willis, District Attorney Fonnie Willis, has now, uh, according to the latest breaking news, have accepted the resignation of Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade based upon that major decision that was made earlier today by Judge Scott McAfee saying that, Ms. Willis, either you stay on, in order to stay on the case, you have to, uh, uh, Mr. Wade has to go or you have to go. She decided, they decided rather, Mr. Wade decided to step off. Ms. Willis will stand on the case and I want to get your take about it. So join us in the conversation, post your comments, share your thoughts and stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Pull up a chair, take your seat, the Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The 
Cash App is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, joined by our wonderful sisters and contributors, Corinna Denise, Kimberly Morrow. Uh, let's get into it, ladies. This is the big conversation that has uh, dominated the news for the day. Uh, of course, we are finding out that uh, earlier this afternoon, earlier today, the, the Georgia uh, district, Georgia judge Scott McAfee had put out an ultimatum to um, figure out how this whole process is going to move forward and who's going to stay and who's going to go. He took, gave the ultimatums, essentially saying that, look, either Fonnie Willis drops out, Nathan Wade drops out, but somebody has to go. Well, mm -hmm. it looks like Mr. Nathan Wade, special prosecutor, has decided to resign, and that will leave uh, District Attorney Fonnie Willis to stay on to the case Here's what Nathan Wade said in a few minutes. He uh, a few minutes ago he uh, he has shared his resignation letter. Let's post that. He said the furtherance of the rule of law and democracy is and always has been the north star of our combined efforts in the prosecution of those who are alleged to have attempted to overthrow the results of Georgia's 2020 presidential election. Our team is dedicated to ensuring that a Fulton County jury in a Fulton County courtroom renders a true and just verdict in his case. As directed by the order today in State of Georgia versus Donald J. Trump, I hereby offer my resignation effective immediately as special prosecutor for the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Although the court found that, quote, the defendants failed to meet their burden of proving that the district attorney acquired an actual conflict of interest, I am offering my resignation in the interest of democracy and dedication to the American public and to move this case forward as quickly as possible. I am proud of the work our team has accomplished in investigating, indicting, and litigating this case, seeking justice for the people of Georgia and the United States, and being a part of the effort to ensure that the rule of law and democracy are preserved has been the honor of a lifetime. I am sure that the case and the team will be in good hands moving forward, and justice will be served. You, the team on this case, and the entire office have my prayers for your safety and your success in the pursuit of justice, respectfully. Nathan J. Wade Esquire. Okay, so he gave his, and then just a few moments ago, guess what, Kimberly? Guess who accepted the resignation? Bonnie Willis. Bonnie Willis, <laughs> praising Mr. Wade for his courage to accept the role, even though he did not seek it. But she essentially said that she accepted it, affected immediately. She complimented, she said, I compliment you for your for the professionalism and dignity you have shown over the last 865 days as you have endured threats against you and your family, as well as unjustified attacks in the media and in court on your reputation as a lawyer. She says that uh, I will always remember and will remind everyone that you were brave enough to step forward and take on the investigation and prosecution of the allegations that the defendants in this case engaged in a conspiracy to overturn Georgia's presidential election. You are an outstanding advocate. In the 865 days you served on this case, you completed a thorough investigation that required the use of a special purpose grand jury to compel the testimony of witnesses inside and outside of Georgia, 
including litigating eight states, the D.C., the District of Columbia, and the United States Supreme Court to obtain critical testimony. You led a team that secured a true bill of indictment against 19 individuals who are accused of violating Georgia law to undermine the 2020 election for the former president of the United States. You have successfully litigated in the United States District Court and the United States Courts of Appeal for the 11th Circuit to ensure that Fulton County citizens will be the jurors who decide justice in this case. Wow. She first, she ends the, her letter with saying that she, please accept my sincere gratitude on behalf of the citizens of Fulton County, Georgia for your patriotism, courage, and dedication to justice. I wish you the best in your future endeavors. Oh, mm -hmm. oh. Mm. Well, like Tabitha Brown always says, very good, you know? <laughs> very good. And All you right. know what? It's real ironic how it's been coming across our news desk, right? Every Friday when the news broke, we were on panel together. Um, we were on it. You know, we were right. on it. The hearing, <laughs> and now today with the resignation, it's like we were on it. This is this is how you close the story. <laughs> we get this the is how you close the story. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, Corinna, thank you for um, pointing that out. Yeah. That is that is very true. That yeah, is true. From start to so finish, y'all have been the ones speaking on this. Can't believe what she said. I, I, I have to say this. I'll never forget that first one when Corinna came in. It was like it was breaking news. And she was like, I haven't had a chance to read this yet. I need to see what's going on. That's right. That's right. She came in and we just threw her in the fire and she was, we need to find out what's really happening before we just start talking about it. So, yes, this is yes. wonderful. I love how it's come full circle. And it's coming. We, we, we're the team. <laughs> It was the team. Yeah, y'all are definitely the team. Here's the thing, though. It it, it, it was like a no-brainer. I'm going to be honest with you. It was a no-brainer. When the judge, first, let me just tell you, and Corinna, you 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 brought this to my, I mean, we, we kind of briefly spoke about this on IG. When ABC News, this is, this is the thing, y'all, because I don't know if y'all been, like, watching how this whole thing played out since this morning. There have been so many different headlines about this decision. And now up to this point, when ABC News, I said, it was like, Fonnie Will's taking off the case. ABC News, y'all know better. NBC News reported, Fonnie Willis can be taken off the case based upon special conditions. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the way that the story broke, it, 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 it says a lot about, you know, the direction that people want to get. And a lot of people, I think, have been confused, like, even who was resigning? From was it Nathan Wade who resigned, or was it yes. Fonnie or Willis that resigned, or no. right? Mm -hmm. So it's 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 interesting that you gotta you know sometimes when these big stories happen, you have to take the time to you know like kind of wait a few minutes and stuff because it's so much is happening, it's and happening we, so fast, and then people are trying to get the stories out first. The judges are. Uh, the name evades me right now. You know when they they do the final thing when the judge is writing out what whatever he decided that is public knowledge that's online um, that is public knowledge. You can go online and read i believe it's like about 23 pages page nine stood out the most to me um you know because i'm happy that we can move forward now with this case but unfortunately it doesn't look like from what i understand that it's completely over for fanny willis and what i mean by that is there are probably going to be some other ethics boards and stuff that she's going to have to face you know yeah. in georgia um, but yeah. at least I'm hoping that we can move forward with the case because we've delayed enough. I know the Trumpsters are mad as hell, but so what? Well, we, <laughs> you're right. We, we have delayed enough. But you know what? I want to bring up a couple of things. We got to take another pause. So I want to bring up a couple of things that Judge McAfee did say that I think will still follow her, Kimberly, for mm -hmm. the rest of her career. This does leave a stain on her work, her legacy, and I want us to talk a little bit more about it. Stay with us, folks. The conversation continues on the other side here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. 
we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Pastor Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Farajji Muhammad, joined by our wonderful contributors, Corinne and Denise and Kimberly Morrow, as we talk about that great, uh, this, I guess, this story around DA Fonnie Willis and Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade, how uh, Mr. Wade has decided to resign and basically remove himself from the case so that DA Fonnie Willis can stay on the case of prosecuting former President Trump and his associates for election tampering per the orders, the ruling from Judge Scott McAfee. Now, as much as Mr. Wade has removed himself, he resigned, Fonnie Willis accepts his resignation. That part is done, but there are still some remnants of this case. And in Judge McAfee's uh, remarks, there are a number of things that he brought up that could potentially happen, and to your point, Corinna, that could still happen to leave a very big stain on her work and her legacy, even though she's moving forward with prosecuting the case against Trump. One of the things he did say, Judge McAfee said, that he was highly critical of 
Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade's relationship, describing it as being the result of bad choices. He said, yet Georgia law does not permit the finding of an actual conflict for simply making bad choices, even repeated, repeatedly. So he said that uh, uh, making this point that she, by her making these bad choices, it's not enough to take her off the case, but it does leave a stain on her ability to hurt her judgment. And so Kimberly, you know, when we're talking about the whole conversation about women in power, but especially black women in power, do you think that that is going to have any, you know, carry any weight in that part of the conversation? Oh yeah, I, I'm pretty, yes. Um, first of all, again, this is a black woman with a lot of authority. So mm -hmm. it is definitely going to, I don't want to say hurt her in trying this case, but it's definitely going to hurt her because they are, it's my understanding from this, he's almost greenlit it for it to go to the ethics commission. Mm -hmm. um, and also I believe um, uh, there's going to be a Senate hearing in regards to it. So there are, there are some, some definite issues re regarding this, and it's it it's it's unfortunate. But can I point out another thing he said? Yeah. That I want us to kind of talk about. He said um, neither side was able to conclusively establish by a preponderance of the evidence when the relationship evolved into a romantic one, but an odor of mendacity remains. And this has been kind of hot on a lot of different talk shows. I've, I've kind of like heard, heard them mention it, but basically for layman's terms, what he said was this still stinks of lies. Mm. So that, that part right there and the fact that that is in that document, mm -hmm. that doesn't play very well because he's, he's acknowledging they could not prove anything but he's saying it he still feels like there was some lying going on that she may instead her and nathan wade may have been lying about the timeline of their relationship again he doesn't specifically say their name but right 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 tell that to he's yeah. referring to that there he still believed that there's some there was some lying going on yeah 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 so, so he's so taking that's it, how, it, it yeah no, no, and, and I'm glad that you brought that up because Corinna, that means that, you know, the, the, the cultural support that Fonnie Willis has received, right? Mm -hmm. um, when, when, when you're talking about, when she had that fiery testimony, and let me just add to the, what you add, what you mentioned, Kimberly, not only did it leaves open that door of whether the truth was actually told, even Scott McAfee said, hey, your testimony was unprofessional. Yeah, he says says is unprofessional. So yeah. so now you have those two big things that are like on your on your record, right? Uh, as a public as a public servant, Corinna, you you that you might be lying, and that you're you you showed the world your attitude, and that's unprofessional. Ah, it, 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 is that going to hurt it down the road? I don't. I don't know. We don't know. I can't say. I mean, no. I mean, it definitely could. And let's just be clear here why it would honestly hurt her down the road. Not only is she a, a public servant, but, um, you know, she's black and she's a woman. Um, so let's just be very clear with that. And you know what? I just want to throw some food for thought in this. Speaking yeah. of servants, we got a former public servant running for re-election who got indictments up the yin yang and it seemed like his record is just unscathed no matter what he still has millions of supporters and no matter how many stains are on his record they still want him to be the one to lead them so i guess when you have certain privilege and you're not melanated um even though you're a public servant and you commit these um these crimes or whatever the case may be you looked at a yeah. little bit differently so that's my take but to your point, yes, definitely, considering, you know, um, and, and this could also look like, and I believe, to your point, Kimberly, the judge mentioned something along the lines of, and I'm just paraphrasing that, you know, I guess, again, when the next election is like, the people could decide. 
you know, if she's going to remain in her position. There they go. That's a great point. Right? Um, but yeah, I just wanted to bring some attention to that because it's unfortunate that, you know, we always say we don't want to play the race card. And, you know, despite the fact that, yeah, this was not a smart decision on her part, but it is what it is. And we know that it would probably pan out a little bit differently. But yeah, I, this is this is not the complete end. But, you know, the case needs to move forward. They've delayed enough, but I won't be yeah. surprised if they appeal and they're going to go in their toolbox and continue to see what they can do to oh, kill absolutely. Time until November. Here's, here's another part of this process as we wrap this part of the conversation up. The, gov uh, the judge, Scott Mac McAfee, also warned of the potential for a future gag order against Fonnie Willis. Um, he said this as a result of the speech that she made in, at the, at the uh, church in Atlanta in January about the case was uh, about the case. And, and Scott McAfee, Judge McAfee said that that speech was legally improper during the speech earlier this year. She defended Nathan Wade, suggested he was being targeted because he was a black man. And so uh, the, Judge McAfee said the comments were far enough removed from a jury trial that it would not establish a permanent taint of the jury pool. But the court cannot find that this speech crossed the line to the point where the defendants have been denied the opportunity for a fundamentally fair trial or that it requires the district attorney's disqualification. But it was still legally improper. Providing this type of public comment creates dangerous waters for the district attorney to wade further into. Mm. So, so, so you see what I'm saying? Like, she, she's still mm. taking some hits, right? She, yeah. she kind of yeah. got, she's still, she's taking some hits, right? And mm. now I think, I think, ladies, as we close out, I think this is would be a great, uh, what do they call it? Teaching moment. Teachable teaching moment. moment, teachable moment, right? Um, for us in terms of looking at how we are in public office, right? Because yeah, we can be like, yeah, go ahead, Fonnie. Yeah, stay on the case. But this is about character. This is about choices. This is about people. And, and this is not about the law necessarily, but this is about a woman who made a decision and you know did not fully think through the consequences of her actions especially in light of this case and how it still threw everything off. And so, you know, it's a teachable moment, I think, you know, Kimberly, that 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 a lot of us can kind of learn from because it's all well and good. You can come up on the stand and you can, you know, show yourself and boom, boom, boom. But guess what? There are some consequences to your actions. And even in that simple moment before this thing really took steam, she went to the church, gave about a 30 minute plus speech about her feeling the way she felt at the time. Now it may come back to bite her in the ass and be used against her. But wh wh what's the teachable moment? What's the lesson that we can learn from this? Ooh, well, first of all, there is definitely a teachable moment, number one. So law students who are watching this their law professor should definitely be pointing out to them, these are the things you do not want to do. If you are involved in something like this, you respond in writing to the appropriate um, um, places. So she had been served with the document, she should have responded in writing. Her response should not have been in church. And stay off the stand. <laughs> She and, did and not you know have what? to get on that stand. They were not going to call her. She should have stayed off that stand. You know what? She should have not spoke at all. That's what I said. She should have stayed off the stand. And I'm and saying she even not at the church. At that church. That's what I said. She absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah she, she should have spoken at all, unfortunately. To the document and writing. She should not have yeah. responded in that church public forum. So those are two teachable moments that law school professors should definitely be sharing with their law students. Mm. Well, I'm not a lawyer yet. I'm not a lawyer yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I don't feel I can speak knowledgeably as to whether or not she should have been on the stand or whether she should not have gone on the stand. Yeah. But I just, we just need to pack this up. I'm not saying we're supposed to forget. Yeah, we need to acknowledge the things that happened, but I want to see this case move forward. That's well, the case with. is not going to look. The case is not. It, it doesn't. And, and Scott McAfee said this. He said it does not hold weight for the disqualification right. of the indictments. 
right? right? So we already know the case is going to move forward. But now we are in a situation where even though she's staying on the case, like moving forward, like, and I'm going back to the point that you made, you think, I, I think you made an excellent point. When she's talking about up for reelection, she, we, we may not see her in that position again. And for the long haul, if we're talking about, and I know this is very important to you, especially Corinna, you're talking about long-term changes. She's out there, she might've just put herself out the box and the state of Georgia may not put another black woman in for a few years as a result well, of this. Well, well, Fulton, County, County. Fulton County, I believe that she can rehabilitate her image and be of course. Listen, this is America. Uh, this is America. the Tangerine Tyrant we after got, all these we got, is on the ballot. But, right? but, but check it out though, different standards, so Corinna. Different Barney standards. You right no, different that? standards. Look, man, people were calling Fonnie like she was the daughter of Satan just for having a relationship, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, people were acting as if this sister was like, oh, my gosh, she mm -hmm. lied? Oh, my gosh, she had an improper relationship? Come on, man. Like, people, we make bad choices. Sometimes good people can do bad things or make bad choices, right? We know that. But there was no, I mean, look. We, we, I think for me, and I, y'all know where I stood. I was like, I ain't. Yeah, that I was the teachable moment for you, right? When me and Kim came for you that day. Because we weren't going to go for that with Fonny, right? When you had to pull out that hazmat. <laughs> you probably didn't need the hazmat last week because I wasn't here, but I'm back. So I hope you, you I, dust it off. It's still, it's still. Look, 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 check this out. <laughs> I'm not, look, the sister stayed on the case, but, but, but moving forward, I don't know. I don't know. I can't I can't say definitively whether it like th the way she handled the situation and now listening to what the judge has to say, it still was a little a, a little knocked. It, it knocked it, it. It still went against her in some way, shape or form. Now, can she rehabilitate, as you say, Kimberly? Absolutely. I think she can. But will she rehabilitate as the district attorney for Fulton County? The people will decide. There it is. You got it. She better be on her Mary and Barry. All right, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put it on the record. So so when she went re, wins the election, you I'll say. Remember, I said I will. I, I have no problem. I'm not. I have no problem. <laughs> but I'm going on the if record. she doesn't look, if she I don't know when her reelection. I don't know when her election comes back up or comes back around for that role. But if she doesn't win. You know what I'm saying? And, and somebody say a more conservative person is put in that seat, for example, if that happens, then, you know, we will understand it. But this is about character. This is about a person and choices. This is not about her being a district attorney. This is a woman who made personal decisions in a workplace setting, and that got her caught up. That's all this is about. That's got her caught up. And I think each and every single one of us can learn, like, damn, Sometimes your, your your choices can have so many heavy consequences that it can almost, almost disrupt the progress that you wanted to make. And if I was funny, I'd go home tonight, say, get right on my knees and say a prayer. She probably hope. already did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And hope. All right. Let's, we we got to get out of here. Hey, look, I appreciate y'all so much. Let me see what the crew is checking in. All right, folks, uh, Brian, you said Fonnie going on the stand was her 15 minutes of fame, which was great in a way for black history and women history. It could be, it could be. Um, Olivia, you said Atlanta will come out and vote for her. That's why she spoke at Bethel AME and took the stand. I hear that. Thank you so much, Olivia. We appreciate that. We will have to see. And you are not a victim. You said she has lost all credibility, ouch. Ouch. We will like see. I said, the minions, the Trump minions lining up despite the long lengthy sheep on his record, the black people gonna come out and probably reelect DA Fonda. I hope so. I hear there it is. All right, Corinna Denise, thank you so much. Kimberly Morrow, thank you so much. I hope y'all sisters have a great weekend. But God willing, we look forward to reconnecting with you next week for another set of exciting conversations. But thank y'all so much for being so good for the culture. Indeed. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for having us. Have a good Absolutely. Weekend. All right, folks, that's going to do it for me. Culture Crew, thank y'all so much for checking in. Make sure y'all do your due diligence. Support us. Go to blackstarnetwork.com. Download the app and do all of the great things. We need your support. So make sure y'all check us out there. Also, follow us on social media at Blackstar Network. 
While you're on social media, follow me, yours truly, Faraji Muhammad, at The Real Faraji on Instagram, at Faraji on X, and at Faraji Muhammad on Facebook. All right, stay tuned up next at 6 p.m. Rolling Martin Unfiltered, as always, never be afraid to challenge what's wrong. Stand for what's right while being yourself in the process. God willing, we will talk on Monday for another exciting edition of The Culture right here, only here, exclusively here on the Black Star Network. Have a great afternoon. Have a wonderful weekend. Talk to you soon. Peace. <laughs>